The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha, Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world of investment choice that goes beyond borders. Open up a world of investment opportunity with NetWealth, where you can access local and international securities, as well as bonds and foreign currency options for wholesale clients. Offer your clients flexibility, transparency, and efficiency with managed accounts, managed funds, and access to non-custodial assets. A world of investment awaits you. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter diamond Titus, and this week we're kicking off the first of our new Advice Tech feature episodes, where we sort of discuss broader ideas and issues the industry is facing when it comes to tech. But I promise next week we'll return to our regular programming and dive into a specific app. Now, today's feature topic is tech and the client value proposition, and who better? to have the first of these conversations with than the self-confessed tech geek from NetWealth and a particularly stylish wearer of Silicon Valley chic. It's Matt Heine. Woo! Uh, that's very generous of you, Peter. Good to be back. It is. I'm so glad to have you back. I mean, you're my first returning guest for the Advice Tech Podcast. And I think you were back all, all the way in episode five. Mm, it feels and like we're a long in the time 40s ago. Now. It does feel mm. like a long time ago. I feel mm. like I've aged since then. <laughs> but before we dive in, as we always start, and, and the listener knows this, we normally would dive into things like emoji use and smartphone apps and all that sort of stuff, which we've done with you before. So... As a returning guest, the first thing I'd love to know to learn a bit more about your tech use is if someone came to you and offered to build the perfect AI buddy just for you, what task would you want it to magically do for you? That's a, that's a very good question. I'm actually a bit disappointed that you didn't ask me the same question you did last time. So I was, <laughs> I was a bit embarrassed by my response. It was very pedestrian and and, uh, and had I had more time, I'm sure I could have come up with something much better. <laughs> so what, what would I have as my perfect AI buddy? So probably like many listeners, I'm already using ChatGPT for mm -hmm. a whole range of things, including uh, writing bedtime stories for my kids at night, <gasps> uh, which if you haven't done it, is great fun because oh my de goodness. depending on what time of the night it is, you can choose a 500-word story or a 1,000-word story. And basically, you get them to pick the key ingredients. So the last <gasps> one I wrote was, my son wanted to turn into a lizard and uh, fight evil with his best friend, Evander. And what was amazing about it was it actually – not only wrote a beautiful story, uh, but then it finished the story with the uh, the moral of the story, uh, which was about despite diversity um, and facing into adversity, uh, when you're supported by good friends and family, you can fight whatever oh. you want. So that was, it was pretty amazing. Amazing. So if you haven't tried it, I highly recommend it. But That's what, incredible. What would I want as an AI buddy? Probably um, along a similar theme. If I could have an app or some technology that translated what I asked my children into something that they actually listened to, that would be <laughs> that would be amazing. Like the intuitive translation, right? So it's Correct. not it's not language to foreign language, it's it's intent to something that they're interested into. Like maybe it makes it into a rap song or something, so that at least they're listening as you as you ask them to do things. Exactly right. So if you come up with anything, please let me know. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I'm definitely stealing the chat GPT use. That's fantastic oh, for a bedtime story because there's nothing worse mm. than those of us that aren't that creative trying to come up with a random bedtime story. It's just not pretty. Yeah. You know, it's when you start to fail as an adult. I've discovered when you try to do those things. And, and the best bit is, which I haven't done yet, but it's uh, next on my list, is you can then use Dali to actually illustrate the story that you've just written <gasps> on chat GPT. So, um, yeah, hours of entertainment. 
Oh, my goodness. Yeah, everybody's running away. They've all paused now and they're all going to run away and do it now. So now my second question actually is sort of taking a look back, I guess. Look, not all new tech is good tech, right? Not all new tech makes things better. Is there anything that you love the analog version of better than the new tech? Can I just go with life? Yeah. <laughs> Living. Yeah. Living. Living. <laughs> life was a lot easier without a, a mobile phone and a, and a laptop. It sort of is. I completely. It's why we all love holidays when yeah. you can, when you can just lose. You know, you have no contact. There's no Wi-Fi. I love it when they say that we don't have any internet. It's actually my favorite favorite thing to do is to to lock myself away without a phone, uh, up in the hills for five days uh, with no technology, no newspapers. Uh, you come out feeling incredibly refreshed. It's uh, it's liberating. It is. I do the same. I pretend that that planes don't have Wi Fi anymore. I just pretend like I can't do any of that. Just relax. I get too All righty. It, right, right, right. Let's dive into client value propositions and tech, shall we? So, advisors like me, you know, we often focus on tech, uh, and we focus on that sort of operational efficiency. You know, the productivity sort of focus, which is natural. I mean, that's where technology's always started. Um, but there's loads going on in the client value proposition space. This can be whether it's investment philosophy or even the customer experience. So, you know, let's start with the investment philosophy and offer. We're doing, you know, a lot of discussions about that on the Ensemble platform. Advisors are really going much further in terms of what they're trying to deliver. What are you guys seeing in terms of clients' needs or demands from firms and what they want, you know, in terms of how we need to enhance or sort of reconsider our investment philosophies? Yeah, so I think this is a trend that's been playing out for some time now. So it started in the US um, you know, probably 10 years ago and we've seen yeah. – Seen, seen movement in the Australian market, but really has accelerated, I think, throughout COVID uh, with market volatility and the need to be doing more uh, regulation overload, et cetera. And I guess rather than getting into a discussion necessarily now about different legal structures, SMAs, MDAs, if we, if we sort of talk broadly about automated investment solutions, so finding uh, ways to scale your investment philosophy is really what advisors are looking for. Yeah. Um, and really that means that if they can find a way to first of all, articulate and describe what their value proposition is around their investment philosophy and then implement it as efficiently as possible. It means that they can start to really focus on delivering great service and and focus on that strategic piece, which is um, where, where we all know advisors can add the most value. So we really see, have seen you know, managed accounts particularly um, you know, grow exponentially over the last three years. And uh, I've just done a roadshow around Australia talking about some of the things that we're up to and one of the interesting statistics was that uh, if you look at our managed account in 2019, so we've been in the market for five years, we were one of the sort of the pioneers, if you like, um, in the managed account space. And but it had taken some time to get traction. And so mm-hmm. um, in 2019, the the size of our managed account was uh, two and a half billion dollars. Now, if you fast forward to today, uh, it's in excess of thirteen billion dollars, or you know, three and a bit years later, which okay. just shows you that exponential growth throughout that period. Uh, and what's really interesting is that within that managed account, we've got a very, very diverse user base. So we've got uh, everything from you know smaller practices dealing with accumulators mm-hmm. all the way through to very high net worth individuals, ultra high net worth individuals looking at customized um, portfolios and, and everything in between. So from our perspective, it's not a product. It's just a really efficient way to actually implement a firm's investment philosophy. And that might be that they believe in passive management with um, uh, strategic asset allocation, or it might be that they actually believe equities can add more value in the Australian market, but they want indexes and managed funds for overseas. So right. the, tool, the tools and the capability of managed accounts, and that could be through an SMA or an MDA, um, you know, are very far, far superior to what they were uh, five years ago and certainly 10 years ago, um, and really allow firms to differentiate their offer through their investment philosophy. Mm. Um, but also make sure that they're treating all their clients equally and that everyone's got the same access to their best ideas uh, at the same time. And it's an interesting um, nuance there because I think a lot of the discussion around managed accounts and all of the permutations thereof can be a focus on the investment insights and all of that expertise when that's only half of the tale. You know, the other half is this ease of implementation. So, so, and when I say that, I mean having something very personalised for that client and then being able to implement that easily. You know, that was always something that's been so clunky historically. Yeah, and and, and for any advisor that's, um, you know, had to uh, try and run the business, service clients, rebalance portfolios over the last three years during extreme volatility, 
uh, it's actually not possible uh, and no. to deliver a great outcome to the client. So what we saw was um, you know, incredible outcomes because investment committees were able to look at overnight data. They were able to convene in the morning, make a decision and literally implement ideas that day for all of their clients. And that meant that as markets fell, they were able to de-risk portfolios by removing assets. And as opportunities presented, they were able to take um, those opportunities as they arose. So people were able to actually come out of it um, in a far better circumstance than they would have had they not been in a managed account. Um, and then you see really interesting combinations of it. We've got people using MDA licenses and investing into SMAs for certain asset classes. And certainly the, the anecdotal evidence there is that they've suggested that they've added maybe up to 3% alpha because mm-hmm. the first time they've been able to take the ideas that they've had from the investment committee and implement them in a reasonable time rather than taking one, two, three months maybe to get through all of their clients. And certainly, um, I mean, this has got to play a part when you start talking about ESG, and I hate that acronym because it's covering such a broad mm. range of things. It's a bit, it's a bit just like calling it markets, you know. But anyway, it's it's whatever the lens that that client has. Well, you know what's important to them. The the it can't just be well. There's this fund, you know. It just can't just be that because everybody's view on what is the highest priority for them. What's the thing that's icky for them? I mean, really, that's a lot of what they're looking for. Yeah, I really, I'm not comfortable with that industry. You know, those sort of things. Um, and I think it's going to be a challenge just to have a fund that handles that. I think it is going to end up being more and more personalized, you know, because the information is going to get better too. I mean, there's, you know, tools starting to come out that don't just assess the underlying investments. They're going to assess the fund manager. They're also going to assess the platform. Like all of us are going to start to be assessed on our sustainability targets, you know, so the information is going to be there. We're going to need a way to be able to pull that together and act on it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that your, your comment on the platform is absolutely spot on. We are regularly being asked uh, by clients to see what our CSR strategy is uh, because they want to make sure that it's not just the investments that they're investing into that are doing the right thing, but the providers in the middle uh, are also having a, a, an impact and uh, contributing back to the community. So uh, yeah. that that is very much front and centre. Um, ESG is probably a topic for another day. I could spend hours talking about it. Uh, I think there is a long way to go. Um, mm. I think that unfortunately the data isn't necessarily there to support the right outcomes. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of people working on it to make sure that we get more relevant uh, outcomes, uh, but to rely purely on, uh, I guess, some of the current providers uh, is a mistake. But look, it's really good. I think it's heading in the right direction. Um, and we know it's important to clients. Yeah. And that's the thing. I think people um, just are going to expect more and more ability to personalize, but also gain access. You know, they're going to want to be able to gain access to alternatives and other things that otherwise we used to sort of be outside the primitive of a an advisor, right? And so that's just going to be the expectation of the public. Um, and our tools are going to have to reflect that. Yeah. And we're saying that we get uh, a lot of pressure or feedback or whatever you want to call it from our clients, <laughs> which we love because feedback is a gift. Uh, but around um, the, the platform or the, the administration services that they're using shouldn't constrain um, the investment choice yeah. or the investment requirements of their client base. Um, and so we spent a lot of time uh, over the years looking at you know, how do we make sure we support more and more of those asset classes or asset types that have been traditionally very hard to get hold of. Um, and we're seeing some really interesting combinations that are very differentiated um, using all of the different tools in different ways. Yeah. And it's, um, look, I'm actually a bit curious then about, um, I mean, we spoke about AI very re- briefly up the front, but, you know, are you, either you yourselves or what you're seeing out there, is AI being used more in any of the back office sort of admin perspective for platforms or investments? Is that coming up more and more? Look, there's a lot of people talking about it. Uh, okay. I think one of the interesting observations, there's quite a few articles on this, a um, bit of a segue, but um, Apple's just released their new uh, spatial computing headset. Mm-hmm. Now, you'll notice in that launch, they didn't mention AI, virtual reality once. No. They were very clear that that has got a, uh, a bit of a stigma attached to it now. And so they're seeking to actually recreate and redefine what it is that they do without sort of getting sucked into all, all of the buzzwords. And uh, there is a tendency for firms uh, and I think companies to, to throw around AI uh, when it might be uh, basic data analytics or, or machine yep. learning uh, as opposed to true AI. But at the other end, there are some uh, obviously very incredible um, businesses being built on on true AI. And uh, obviously we've, we've talked about um, ChatGPT and some of the the, uh, the outcomes that that's producing. So uh, I think w- when you think about AI, Moving forward, so there's a lot of business, a lot of companies that we're all already interacting with on a daily basis that we use to run our businesses that are using mm-hmm. AI. Um, I'm incredibly excited about where Microsoft is heading with their Copilot products and how that's going to be just embedded into everything that we use day to day, and that's really not that far off. 
Uh, obviously, Apple, Google uh, all have you know very strong AI capabilities and machine learning capabilities behind them. So, uh, moving forward, as we pick technology, it's important to make sure that we are looking at forward two or three years and to understand what their AI or machine learning roadmap is as opposed to perhaps uh, taking it that it does do it, do it today or it doesn't do it today. Uh, but yeah, we're probably as guilty as others. But you know, we're doing some really interesting things internally uh, from an operational perspective that help us identify documents, automatically index documents. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're uh, using the technology to identify and redact TFNs as an example. Yep. Um, so I think that the tools and the technology is uh, is certainly accelerating, uh, and we're going to see it just populated into our day to day life. Yeah, and I guess um, I mean I'm with you with Microsoft. I I wondered if they were just going to be too slow. Like this could be one of those moments where they, you know, there's almost the Kodak moment where they just lose a market because they're too slow to respond. But they've really sort of taken that leap. Um, Mm. They really look – and it's perfect. All of those tools we use every day, they're perfect applications for AI. Mm. You know, there's so many repetitive things we do in them. Um, So I love that they're actually taking, you know, taking that leap and going down that that path. I'm curious – I think Microsoft's the company to watch uh, and if – if uh, I know it was one of your questions, people often ask who are the uh, leaders that I most admire. Mm-hmm. Satya has got to be up there. He's turned around a huge business in a very short period of time. Yeah. Um, and, a huge elephant, and right? A, hu- a huge <laughs> elephant and doing some of the most incredible things. Uh, so kudos to them. Yeah, it is exciting. Mm-hmm. And I guess, you know, for those of us that, I mean, you will have a deep understanding of the difference between all these things, but for those of us that don't, AI sort of falls into a category a bit like blockchain for me in that it's like computer power. Like it's like, how can you do more with less? Uh, are you seeing more and more things sort of taking advantage of blockchain as a tool as well in investing? Uh, no. No? <laughs> no, they're not, they're, not, they're not going down that path yet? They're not sort of taking advantage of what's out there? No, look, I, I think block, blockchain as a technology is potentially very powerful um, and where we haven't seen evidence of, uh, I guess, blockchain in this industry is really the the business models that sit on top of it. Um, right. There's you know, been, been different blockchain projects within their industry. One of them's just closed down, um, mm-hmm. which some uh, which was around uh, fee disclosures and, and fee consent. Um, yeah. And the, the reality is that there's really good databases and good technology that can solve a lot of the problems that people have tried to solve with blockchain and didn't necessarily need to. Okay. Um, so I'm not saying it's, uh, it's dead. I think it's just really got um, a long way to go before we start, start to see real practical applications. Um, I know there's people that are looking at building new exchanges. Obviously, chess has not been uh, a great example of a, of a use no. case of, of blockchain, uh, probably the, wor- the worst use case. Yes. Um, and, uh, and and that's going to set the industry back because people will be mm. naturally gun-shy now. So I, I think it's a good technology. It's really about the business case and, and the business layer uh, that I haven't seen anything amazing yet. Yeah. And I guess, you know, I mean, you mentioned security and it's clearly front of mind for all of us now. Um, and I, I only imagine you guys are, are well down, down that path as well. Are you seeing, um, yeah, are we evolving fast enough with that? Do you think, do you think the industry is keeping up with what it needs to be doing on the sort of cyber risk and protecting our clients or, or do you feel like we're playing catch up a little? Oh, I think it's a, a long way to go. Uh, so yeah. Cyber is hard. Um, the attacks are incredibly sophisticated. Uh, the number of attacks, the sophistication of the attacks is incrementally um, you know, huge um, since uh, the beginning of the Ukraine-Russia conflict. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're seeing a, a lot more more activity. Um, and obviously, we're seeing a lot more companies um, you know, suffering um, as a result of cyber attacks. So um, it's something that people just have to be diligent about. You can't hope that it's not going to impact you yeah. as an industry. We have more data than pretty much any other industry, including medical, uh, and we need to do everything we can to, to protect that information. So um, if you're not thinking about it, don't have external professionals helping you. Uh, it's something that you really need to uh, to be looking at. Uh, there's a couple of things on cyber. Uh, one is that people will almost always be the weakest link. And yeah. uh, it's, you know, we can do training you know, every day, uh, but ultimately it's someone that clicks on a link that they shouldn't have or opens an email or an attachment that looked um, suspicious, but... Uh, they hadn't picked up uh, that will cause issues, uh, and equally, you know, we do see a lot of attempted, um, you know, client frauds where, you know, it's the, it's the classic clients overseas because uh, their Gmail account hacked, uh, starts asking the advisor and, and us for money, and uh, before you know it, there's lots of conversations happening left, right, and centre. And you know, luckily, we, we have a lot of processes in place to, to stop those frauds. But um, yeah. you need to be diligent um, and, yeah. and aware. And it is one of those things we talk about in our in our practice where, you know. The best thing at any point is a is a conversation, 
like actually com- like communicating with a person, pick, not pick using it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Just talk to them because that can circumvent so many of these things if somebody just spoken to somebody else. Absolutely. Um, and catch that. Cool. All right. So then if we then take a look at tech in the environment of the client experience, which is probably something that all of us have begun to consider more, but we're probably in earlier stages, you know, we've still got some work to do along that line. We still historically had our client experience almost defined by legislation and that's natural. But I think with everything going on, and I actually think last time you and I spoke, there were some announcements that dropped on the day that we spoke. And just recently, we've also had QAR come out and and some things said that, that are going to be changing. So it's quite good timing. Um, then, you know, technology and the way that it can improve or enhance the client experience is a real thing now, particularly with millennials now being a huge portion of the client prospects we're all going to be dealing with going forward. Yeah, I often joke or comment that the biggest innovation in financial services in the last two decades has been digital signatures. Uh, <laughs> but I think, unfortunately, it's, there's, there is actually a lot of truth to it. And yes. as, as an industry, we, we need to get much better. And yeah. uh, I think your yeah. comment before about uh, the number of millennials it's probably not the point that's relevant. Um, and all of our research would suggest that uh, if we use client portals as an example and, and mobile mm-hmm. client portals, when we've researched and done our Australia, um, advisable Australian reports, the needs and wants and desires of a high net worth uh, established affluent and an emerging um, affluent or millennial with money yep. are almost identical. Yeah, okay. They, they all want to be able to look at uh, their whole of wealth on a mobile. They want to be able to interact with their advisor via chat or some other uh, social media uh, channel or or, um, or or contact yeah uh, they they want to be able to you know, have an idea of what's going on in their um, you know budgeting world so all, all of these things that have been sort of I guess pushed down the line as oh that's something millennials want uh, it's just not true and COVID really mm-hmm. did accelerate that um, and if we all think about our own lives uh, going back to you know our conversation about life being complex, uh, everyone lives on their mobiles these days. Uh, yeah. And so the more that we can interact and create um, context to those interactions, the deeper those client relationships are going to be over time. Um, and there's lots of different ways that that can be done, but we really do need to start investing in that digital front-end experience, uh, not only because we know that um, advice firms that have done it, it's only about 30% of the industry so far, um, but they're seeing much higher levels of satisfaction. They're seeing much um, higher levels of client engagement. And then if you combine that with things like the consistency and reliability of a managed account, mm. uh, you know, all of these things are generating referrals and helping them grow their business. Um, and ultimately, that is as important as making sure that we can produce SOAs and um, and those things as efficiently as possible. So uh, yeah. it is super important. The firms that do it really well are seeing the benefits. Uh, and the ones that uh, continue to underinvest in this area, I think, will find in two or three years that they've lost a lot of ground. And it's an interesting um, thing that when you look back at the way we approach these things, say it was, you know, there would be face to face and then some people were doing video meetings and using more email, all those sort of things is, is the danger is that we see these new things as a secondary option. It's like, oh, we'll have it, but it's just a secondary consideration. And so we treat it accordingly instead of what's probably the case is we almost need to shift to that as the primary. Like we almost need to behave as which, as if those new things, whether it's via the portal chat, whatever it is, is actually the primary way. And hey, we'll, we'll, do it the other way if you need us to, but this is the way we engage because it's a mentality, isn't it? Like mm. it's a complete change in the way your team do things, the default in the way they send things to clients, all of that's got to change. We have to sort of adjust all our workflows and processes accordingly. Yeah. I, I see a world probably in two or three years where e- email is not used as a tool for uh, communicating sensitive information and it, and, yeah. it, and it shouldn't be. Uh, it's, it's not the right tool. So the more that we can you know, work collectively as an industry and with our providers to have document vaults and secure signing secure chats, all those sort of things, the better. And it's a better client experience. So, uh, And I think you touched on a really important point, which is don't think about it as a separate bit of technology. It has to be part of your process, um, Mm. otherwise it will fail. Um, And so think about it from the client perspective, think about how that integrates with what you need to do uh, from an internal perspective um, and, and make sure that it's actually a benefit to both parties. And it is a, a change management exercise, isn't it? I'm sure you guys have seen that for anything you roll out, mm. right? You're going to have to train clients to make the change, even if they're happy to do it. And you're probably going to have to almost nudge them to it, even if they accidentally send you something via email. It's like, fantastic, but can you just try it again via the portal instead of doing it all for them? You know, I think we try and make things easier, but that's okay, I'll handle it. But you're not creating change. You're not giving them the new habit so that they're going to go, say, via the portal every time. Well, you know? And I've seen some great um, practices uh, ad- adopting really interesting ways to embed that change management. So, 
uh, when they first come in uh, f- for their sort of implementation meeting, they'll actually sit down with the client, help them get the app set up, uh, make sure that the facial recognition is working so they don't have to worry, worry about their PIN numbers and, and passwords. Yeah. Um, but the other extreme, and I think this is a great idea, uh, is they get their uh, more elderly clients uh, into for a lunch and learn. Uh, yep. So if you c- come in for lunchtime, we'll get around. It's a little bit like the Apple uh, sessions that they run in the Apple stores uh, and they get them all around the table. They have a little bit of a laugh about um, you know, how hopeless they all are. But yep. through that, they're showing them and, and they're working together with other clients to say, you know, it's not actually that hard. And they mm. get direct feedback as well on the sort of things that their clients said, oh, wouldn't it be cool if uh, you could do this, this and this? Uh, so it's a great way to engage with your clients um, and, and have a bit of fun as well. And they had a huge, Apple had a huge take up from that gener the older, the boomer sort of generation sure. because of that. Some of them were going in every week for another session, you know, and, and nobody else was offering that. You couldn't buy a, P- a normal PC and get that service, yeah. you know, so it is a way to differentiate yourself. And I guess um, I'm curious about your take on businesses like, say, Apple and Amazon. I mean, I know I'm an Amazon Prime member and my complete expectation now is if I order something, it gets here tomorrow. Like it's just <laughs> forgiven. I'm I'm still shocked by it though. Uh, I ordered uh, some things for my computer. I think it was I, I lost my charger for my Garmin watch uh, and needed a USB connector for something or other, and it arrived uh, either that afternoon or the next day. Uh, and it still shocks me, but it's also set that new expectation, hasn't it? And what do we? Th- I mean. There's so many examples of that. And like you say, in our industry, you know, we're so excited that we're doing e-signatures. I guess I'm curious what you think the leaps need to be because part of maybe the problem in our industry is we do do these iterative developments. You know, we're not sort of making these quantum leaps of what's the next thing. For example, should we be using e-signature at all or should be there some other two-factor or some other authentication method that we should just be moving to instead of? You know, I'm, I'm interested in, what, in where we might be sort of almost holding ourselves back a little with some of those decisions. Yeah, I think unfortunately with, with, you know, with digital signatures, often it's the use case that will dictate uh, the signature method. Yep. So there are still, oh, we do digital signatures as an example for pretty much every form. Uh, mm-hmm. There's still certain ones that uh, legally we have to have a, a wet signature for. Uh, but increasingly, as, as we move down the sort of the integrated mobile path, uh, if we can avoid a digital signature and just have a accept reject button, uh, yeah. that's the way we'll go. A, a signature is sort of an interim step because it was convenient and everyone knew how it worked. Mm-hmm. Um, but the reality is all we're wanting is to, to get the go ahead uh, on a piece of work. Yeah. Yeah. And so what else do you think, you know, I mean, you guys have spent a lot of time on, you know, even your portal for net wealth um, and, you know, what people are using. I'm curious what you're seeing in terms of the users and what they focus on a lot. Like, what are you seeing them use? And what are some things that you've put in there that like, nobody takes a look at? You thought, oh, you know, that was that, all that effort and then nobody's really utilized it. Was there any surprises? So I know uh, advisors are certainly pushing people towards the mobile app, particularly where it's branded and they've got a bit of ownership. So yeah. sort of our strategy that sort of going down the product um, side was to make sure it was a standalone bit of tech that people could use regardless of whether they had a net wealth account or not. That was and still is very, very important to us. Mm-hmm. So it's sort of agnostic to, to what we're doing on the other side. Um, but the reason they've done that is, again, it avoids all the issues with logins and passwords uh, because it's a matter of holding it up to your face. Uh, yeah. the, the one feature that's had the biggest take up um, is actually the integrated property feeds. So uh, we launched the product whilst it wasn't quite as big adoption as the uh, Chat GBT app. Uh, the um, I think we had was it nine or nine hundred uh, users over the first couple of weeks add uh, seventeen hundred properties. So on average, two properties, uh, which really just reflects Australia's love of property. Yeah. Um, and the important things to them, where we debated this a lot internally, was you know they wanted to see a picture of the house because they've got an uh, emotional attachment to it, um, and whether they agreed with the valuations or not, they could go in there and put in a uh, owner valuation uh, if they disagreed with the one that was coming from domain. So property, uh, we thought it was an important part of the, the total wealth picture because it's mm-hmm. such a big part of it. Um, but the adoption since then has, has been huge. It's one that people get most excited about, um, and I think bank, banking um, is certainly heading in that direction where people just want to be able to do everything in the one environment and not have to move between m- multiple uh, applications. Yeah, and it's it's um, because I get why for, for the institution I get you know it's well it's it's your w- m- bank whatever your m- bank is uh, and they well that's our app and that's how you log in. But like you say for the client it's like well I, but but I don't care. <laughs> I want to just see all my stuff, right? Why can't Mm. that be in one place? You know, it makes it easy. I've I've got an experience and I won't name the accounting um, software. It's it's one of two. Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) But their view was that rather than building integrated apps themselves, they would just have a huge 
uh, exchange of, of different services. Yeah. The problem for that is it worked really well for the accountant. Um, but as a client, I had to go in, load up a receipt in one app. I then had to approve it in another app. And then if I wanted to see if that had been processed, I had to open up the accounting app. And so I just didn't do it. I went back to sending emails because it was much easier. Um, so again, got to think about it from the client's perspective and um, and solve the problem uh, for them rather than what makes it easy for the advisor. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, that's the, the thing that I'll be curious about as we go further down things like the, you know, the actual apps um, on it, on clients' phones is, sure. is what does, what else makes it easier? Is it something that'll nudge them when they need to do something? Is it like, what are the features that maybe we don't see as important, but will add immense value to them? You know, and sure. I guess that only comes out of asking, right? It only comes out of understanding where their biggest blockages are or interests. Like you say with the property, I mean, <laughs> of all the things that we yeah. could have in there, really? Like really, but everybody's fascinated, and particularly right. when the market's going nuts and a bit a bit berserk, then they're all curious about that. Um, it That's makes the one sense. Thing every know? Australian will have an opinion on. Yes, exactly, exactly right. Is there any other in terms of then the? Oh, I mean, it's not so much productivity, but you know the customer experience. Are you seeing any more things that could be exciting about, you know, say the next best thing for, you know, the advisor to work on for a client or anything like that that you're starting to see that technology can add some real value to? Uh, yeah, so there's, there's a couple of things. And and again, you know, I talk about what we're doing and um, I do that because it's what we actually believe in. So we, we do a lot of the research and we see we think where we uh, where we see the industry going. So uh, I think customizable reporting um, is, is huge and we're, we're spending yep. a lot of money in that space to make sure that an advisor can uh, basically, and we're calling it the advice illustrator, uh, they can tell the story using our data and, uh, and imagery to explain it, uh, the strategy, how they want to to the client and more importantly, how the client will understand it. Yeah. So it could be that you've got a, um, a new client that's not overly literate uh, that ultimately just wants to see what's my balance over time, uh, what's my asset allocation if the advisors uh, just started having that discussion uh, mm-hmm. and maybe what's money in, money out versus yeah. someone that's very sophisticated that's going to want all the bells and whistles and line-by-line line asset performance report and benchmarking and contribution analysis and some of those things. So I think provi- uh, being able to tell the story the way that you want to tell the story to the clients that you want to tell it um, is going to be really important. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's certainly coming. Um, and then if you sort of think about AI. Uh, I, was, I was fortunate to do a, a live interview with the head of uh, data and analytics uh, and AI for Morgan Stanley in the US, where they uh, have 16,000 advisors that they're building solutions for. Um, and they're doing some really cool stuff. And, and they've got an arrangement actually with OpenAI, which is the, the engine that sits behind ChatGPT. Yeah. Uh, and so they're, they're training. So they've had next best actions for some time. So when an advisor logs into their desktop uh, and their whole whole theory is that it's man with machine uh, versus man without. Yeah. And so they're not trying to replace the advisors. They're trying to make them as efficient um, as possible and uh, put them in a position where they can add the most value. Um, and so next best actions uh, is when they first log in in the morning, it basically says this has occurred overnight. Uh, these portfolios might be out of uh, balance or range or you might want to speak to these clients because they hold X stock. Uh, they can then automatically press a button, email those clients or um, arrange a phone call with them. So, you know, that's sort of the first thing that they do when they go in in the morning. Where it's heading, though, is uh, is, is really interesting. So they're using the OpenAI engine. They're training it only on Morgan Stanley data. Uh, mm-hmm. So it can't hallucinate or sort of go off and find <laughs> weird and wonderful statistics from around the, uh, from around the web. Yeah. Uh, and it'll allow the advisors to effectively ask the engine things like, you know, what, what's, what's better, BHP or Rio? Uh, right. And then rather than having to pull down two different research reports and try and work out what the key drivers are and who's doing well where, it would do a full analysis and basically say, um, you know, BHP uh, is, a, is a better option uh, based on the following things. Um, so, you know, again, potentially saving the advisor 20 or 30 minutes of analysis uh, almost in real time while they've got the client on the phone. Um, if it's a new client and the client's asking some broader questions, uh, they can then sort of query, okay, how do I open an account for them now? And it'll automatically walk them through the next steps or uh, how a particular process works. So really driving efficiency using uh, the in-house uh, capability and, um, and the in-house IP around sort of data and, um, and, and research. And I think what's exciting about that is it, is it actually frees you up to be more human, Right, exactly, that's the best exactly. technology. That's what it lets you do. Is it lets you be more human, spend more time with them, on understanding them and what they want to do, and all of that personal stuff, which is fantastic, and the juicy bits, um, because all the rest is 
is worked out. Whereas, I mean, when I think back to some of those meetings I've had years ago when you've got the printed out fact fine and you're spending the whole time, like it's yeah. just horrendous. You know, that's not actually engaging with a client. <laughs> so all of these things give you more time to do that. And I mean, for listeners of the podcast, you know, the Ensemble platform has behind it that we all type in and we chat to each other on and ask questions. It has AI behind it. And so when Ensemble happens to come out with some thought leadership that you feel, wow, that's exactly what I was just thinking about. Well, it's because Ensemble AI is listening and they've they've pulled it all together and said, this is the thing advisors want. You know, how fantastic is that? And as I always say, the trick is to make sure that you use it in a way that doesn't come across as being creepy. Right. (laughs) Right, exactly. It's just insights. You know, it's just actually listening when people talk um, as opposed to digging through all sorts of layers of awful stuff, you know. Yeah, it's it's really fascinating. Is there anything else that you can see sort of coming up that's interesting that you guys might have discovered in in any of your similar visits like your Morgan Stanley one? Uh, So, yes, I think. You're not going to have a conversation these days, unfortunately, without talking about AI. Uh, mm. I think it, it really is evolving uh, rapidly and um, generative AI is, is incredibly exciting and it's going to allow us to, to replace a lot of the processes that um, you know, can take us hours and hours and hours. And I've got hundreds of stories that I could share with you already, but co- conscious of our time. Mm. Um, so I think let's have a look at how that evolves. Uh, you know, SOAs are going to change anyway as a result of QAR. Uh, so yep. how do we use um, some of the tools available to streamline that even further? Uh, so that, that that's important. I think that digital experience uh, providing personalised insights uh, is critical and not that far away. Um, it's got to be hyper personalised. Uh, and to to use a saying that I often use is that we can never forget that the um, the service levels that a client expects are based on the last best experience that they had. Yeah. Um, and inevitably, that will be one of the big tech companies that we all work with, an Amazon or a Facebook, where uh, they do get that hyper hyper personalisation uh, at any time. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think the thing we've got to all watch all the time is applying tech to something that's a crappy process just makes it an even, even crappier process. Like it's not, you know, it's, it's, and that's why the focus on customer experience is so important. You right. know, that's where we need to have the energy where it just makes it easier and even a better um, communication. I think that's something that I'm really interested in is how, how can we get better ways of communicating ideas and concepts in, in advice and using smart tech to do that, you know, rather than. Yeah, well, again, it's chat GPT. I don't know if you've tried this one, but uh, ask it to describe a transition to retirement uh, strategy to a five-year-old. Nice, nice. Oh, well, there's your mission, folks. I feel like that's a fabulous way to finish up. We've all got to go and do that. And and we've got to learn from this, right, of how we can communicate better because that's actually the value we can bring. We can bring that connection with our clients. Um, all right, Advice Explorers, if you'd like to find out more about how Net Wealth works with advisors, you can see the link in the episode show notes. You know where to find them. Um, I hope you got some value out of hearing us geek out over all the future technology issues out there um, and having two tech geeks on the microphone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Matt, and for NetWell supporting the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast as a sponsor. We really appreciate it. Great to be back and always enjoy the chat. <laughs> so, folks, look, there's so much going on, right? I mean, I could I could quiz Matt about the things he's seeing out there of what people are doing, you know, for hours and hours and hours because, It's interesting. I think for lots of us, it can get a bit overwhelming when we hear all these things that people are doing. Uh, The thing is that just keeping, you know, your ears slightly to that, like just, just allowing yourself to be vaguely aware of what's going on will mean that we at the right moment, we hear that thing that can just solve that problem we've got, you know, and we in financial advice, we just absolutely need to understand how far behind we are other industries and we really need to lean into some of these changes. Now, that doesn't mean that we just constantly change the tech stack we have. It doesn't mean you're constantly implementing new technology at all. Not that at all. But I think an awareness of what's happening can even just get us to question the process we use not just the technology. Yeah, it can really, I mean, uh, Matt mentioned something there, you know, the difference between a signature versus an acknowledgement. You know, what are the things internally that maybe a client does that isn't a formal, uh, you know, provider form, it's something they're doing with us. Is there something that could just be an acknowledgement via a portal as opposed to an e-signature? All these little things can really start to add up. Um, And, you know, I'm completely with him on the fact that we've sort of got to plow ahead. Things like QAR will happen, all sorts of other things right, we'll go on, we need to plow ahead, we need to do what we can to understand the risks from things like cyber uh, attacks and and 
all we can do is continue to understand the next best ways to protect ourselves and our clients. And then, hey, let's find out great ways we can deliver value to our clients. What are the things that they just wish they could understand better, do faster, or find more interesting? Um, so I'm hoping that you enjoyed that conversation. We'll be having more of these into the future, uh, these feature episodes. But And next week, we'll be back to interview an, an advice tech provider and, and also provide you with another Curiosity Corner tip. However, I'd love to know if there's other topics you'd love us to dive into in these feature episodes, broader issues that you'd just like to have, you know, me to have a conversation with somebody about as you're curious, um, then please let me know either it's on the Ensemble platform or on LinkedIn. I'd love to hear what you'd like to hear more on. Well, that's all we've got for this week. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each week. And, you know, if you're on your team or a bit stuck in a rut, this year's been a bit rough, you know, you'd love to refresh your process and tech projects going forward, uh, maybe do some planning for the next 12 to 18 months, then I would love to facilitate a brainstorming session for your team, draw out your next best projects for the business, maybe give some thought to what tech could assist, and then give you some habits to put in the practice to help you innovate on a regular basis and really keep on improving and keep on in, on growing. If that's of interest, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. That's LinkedIn forward slash Peter MD, P E I T A M D. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious.